Yeah, a wedding makes it very, very real for everybody. Weddings make things permanent. And it's a finality of the previous family too. So I think people are kind of surprised that they're, they don't know they're grieving the loss of their last family, but they are. From the Family Life Podcast Network, this is Family Life Blended. I'm Ron Deal. This donor-supported podcast brings together timeless wisdom and practical help and hope to blended families and those who love them. And as it turns out, someone agrees with us. We do bring practical help and hope. One person posted this review, thoroughly enjoying this new podcast from Family Life. Ron Deal just has a unique way of making complex marriage concepts sound simple and approachable. Love the quality of the production? That's a nod to you, Bruce. Not just for blended families, five stars. Well, thank you for that review and feedback. We do try to make the complexities of blended family living simpler to understand. I'm glad you're with us. Don't forget, this being podcast number 34, that we have dozens of other podcasts available, all on a variety of subjects about complex dynamics and step family living. They're all designed to help strengthen your home. I hope you'll browse them and find the ones that speak to your family. And subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Just search Family Life Blended with Ron Deal. I get questions and emails every day from people who are asking for help, and they're not sure what kind of help they need sometimes. Today, we're going to talk around how you can find support for your family. How do you find a church who will support you? What if you do if you need counseling? How do you know if you need counseling? And what if not everyone is willing to go? That and much more. Gil and Brenda Stewart are my guests. They live outside Portland, Oregon. They have seven adult children and seven grandchildren. Gil is a therapist and Brenda a life coach. Their ministry is restoredandremarried.com. They have a video curriculum and book for groups called Restored and Remarried. And their podcast, which I've had the privilege of being on, is called Restored and Remarried. They've spoken for Family Life Blended multiple times and are among my favorite trusted voices in the area of ministry. And by the way, they are on my list of recognized Smart Step Family therapy providers that can be found at smartstepfamilies.com. That's a list of people who are uniquely prepared, have done their homework, and they are available to help couples and blended families in particular that are going through some difficulties. This means Gil and Brenda are among a very small number of people around the country who have actively sought out additional training in helping step families. And now they actively coach and counsel blended families on a regular basis. Now, I've been doing therapy with step families for over 27 years, and I do professional training for counselors who want to become smart step family therapy providers. So Gil and Brenda and I are going to put our heads together and we're going to talk about finding the help you need for your family. Here's my conversation with Gil and Brenda Stewart. Well, guys, like me, people reach out to you on a regular basis asking for help. I'm curious, is there a typical question that you hear from blended families? We're confused, don't know what to do, and we're 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 in a mess. How did how did we get here so quick? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Help. <laughs> <laughs> Confused really? and in a mess. Really? How did we get here so quick? Is the emphasis on the so quick? Yeah, yeah. It's like uh, how, how, wow. Uh, we've only been together for a couple of months, and or or oh, by the way, we've been together for a couple of years, and this is just getting worse. And this started, and we mm-hmm. we've been trying to fix it, but it's getting deeper rather than better. Mm-hmm. And I've been seeing a lot on like these Facebook groups and stuff, people sharing that they just feel lonely in their marriage and feeling, you know, like the outsider. Mm -hmm. 
is yeah. the terms I think we sometimes use. So, Well, to Gil's point, I just want to say many times on this podcast, we have shared that it's a pretty common experience in, in step-family situations to the dating and before the wedding stuff was really good and everybody felt very optimistic. And then, you know, within six months to a year after the wedding, there's this, wow, reality has hit and the merger has begun and we're having more difficulty with this than we thought. We've said that before on this program, but I'm so glad you brought it up again, Gil, because it is such a common experience. I, I want people, if you're feeling that or where you're looking back and you're going, yeah, we definitely hit that wall in six months in. That's normal. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily good news that that's normal, but it's good news that that's normal. Yeah. I, I think it's funny that you say six months. In our situation, it was about two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> we we got home from our honeymoon, which we were really fortunate to have because most step family couples don't get that. But when we got home, we, we were already into it two weeks. I was just sitting with a guy yesterday uh, getting ready to remarry, and they're already feeling the pinch because they've they've announced the commitment that they're going to enter into marriage. And so pushback has begun even before they said the I do's and the I don'ts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what, <laughs> so it's immediate sometimes. Yeah. A wedding makes it very, very real for everybody. Yes. Mm-hmm. As the wedding approaches, mm-hmm. it gets more real, but definitely the day of the wedding, it is exceedingly real for everyone. I think couples sometimes who cohabit are really confused by this because they think that well, we've already been living together for a while. Why would a wedding change? Well, look, it's not uh-huh. real until it's real. And there's a sense of permanence that's built into a wedding, which, by the way, is telling you something about (laughs) uh, what cohabitation did for you and did not do for you, right? It's a commentary. Mm -hmm. Everybody Mm -hmm. gets it. Weddings make things permanent. And it's a finality of the previous family, too. So I think people are kind of surprised that they don't know they're grieving the loss of their last family, but Mm -hmm. they are. Yeah. And they don't want to admit that because that would be wrong to do that. But that's part of it. Yeah, for adults and in particular for kids. You know, the I want my mom and dad back together again. I wish dad was alive and not deceased. You know, whatever that story is, this, again, is a reminder that's not going to happen. I think the other thing, too, Ron, about it is, is that when the ring goes on the finger— the permanency, uh, you, you just mentioned, you know, the kids start feeling it and noticing that there's permanence. Believe it or not, because this is a remarriage, it ripples out, frankly, to your former spouse. And they can either go, oh, okay, fine, because they're into their own thing. Or they, if they haven't moved on emotionally, they may freak out on you all over again. And it's like, what in the world? So you have uh, what, what I think we all call the ex spouse in law. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> and and it, and it and and even though they have nothing to do with it, they do have something to do with it because they're connected because of those kids. Yeah, and there's a phenomenon we call the remarriage activated dad or mom, you know? So sometimes as you said, it ripples to the other biological parent in the other home like it's now real for them also that you've gotten married to somebody exactly. else and that there's a step parent in their kids' lives. And sometimes that even activates something. If there's been a biological dad who's kind of been disengaged and uninvolved in his kids' lives, all of a sudden when his former wife gets married again, all of a sudden he's really involved and engaged and asking questions and wanting to be a part of decisions. And she's like, whoa, you know, <laughs> things were better when you kind of ignored us. And now that you're <laughs> now that you're knocking on the door all the time, so to speak— yeah, it, it's made life more complicated for my new marriage and for my husband, now the stepfather. Yeah, all of that happens at weddings. It is a huge emotional rock being dropped in the ocean, and there are uh, ripples that move out <laughs> from that. Well, you quickly. Know, yeah. yeah, quickly. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things I want us to eventually get to, and I want our listeners to know that we are going to spend a little time talking about when you feel distressed in your marriage or your family. Like, what do you do? How do you find support? How do you know when it's time to reach out and find a helper? And what does a helper look like? And we're going to come back to that in a minute. But I want us to just start by talking with people who are listening who just maybe feel like they need a little support. They're trying to get their head around that. What does that look like? What are the options? I know you guys feel the way I do, and that is that blended family couples really need community. They need support. They need to walk with other people, and it is an amazing, wonderful 
supportive environment when they do that for one another, right? We all agree to that. Yeah, oh, sure. Yeah, agree. Yeah. What keeps couples from going to a small group uh, on a Tuesday night in somebody's home, a Sunday school class at their church, you know, just even maybe getting together with one or two other couples and having coffee on a regular basis. What keeps people from actually doing that? Yeah, Brenda, what, what causes that? <laughs> if I knew that. <laughs> we, we'd all be millionaires, uh, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I was at an exercise class yesterday and talking to a gal who she knows that, you know, I'm in a step family and she's probably well, a couple of years into it and was just sharing some of her struggles. And it was like, and it was all textbook stuff and realizing that, you know, some of the issues they were having were challenges from her husband's past relationship. Hmm. And she was just blown away that that would even impact their family. So I say that that if she was in community, she would realize that that's normal. normal. Not that it would make it easier, but I know when I find out that something's normal, then it's like, okay, I'm not alone. So I think sometimes people underestimate what they're going through, and they think that obviously nobody else— I'm all alone. experience is the same. I can't tell you how many times people will tell us, well, I bet you never heard this one. And it's like, well, yeah, we have. (laughs) Hate to tell you, you're not that special. Yeah. (laughs) So, and some of it is just, um, I don't know if it's just education. They don't know maybe that it's okay to ask for help. And I mean, even in first time marriages, sometimes people, especially in the church, are supposed to keep their poser face on that everything's okay. And and it's sad because they're living in marriages that aren't what they could be. And that's kind of what I told this gal yesterday. It's like, that's what motivates Gil and I, because we have such a good time and we're friends and we want everybody to have that in their relationship. And yes, it takes work, but that's what marriage is supposed to be about, even in a remarriage. It's hard, but yet we still have to be have fun and be on the same team, right? Agreed. I think some of the other practical (laughs) obstacles of being in community is Johnny's going left and Betty's going right and my ex-wife is pulling on the other side of me and schedules. Because when families are young and you've got teenagers or younger, everybody is now not only going in three different directions, but maybe 15. Yeah. And so the, the just the reality of their schedules, that in of itself can be an obstacle to get to a small group or a community. I think the other obstacle is, you know, frankly, the availability of small groups within a, in a community. Sometimes it might just be the, the willingness of somebody to start a small group, maybe in their home, or if they can get a room there at the community center, at the church. It's just the aspect of, of availability and someone having the burden to pick up the torch and say, let's let's at least start someplace, mm-hmm. and there's a reluctance. I think the other thing that causes, like what Brenda was referring to, is they don't know they don't know that they need community mm-hmm. right. until they're into a place to where they are drowning and now they're panicking. And that, that in of itself causes emotional mm-hmm. craziness. And I know you guys feel the way I do, that... Th- that causes me emotional craziness when I hear people say that because I know how much benefit they can get out of being in a group yeah. of yeah. people, out of reading a book together. And let's just talk about chapter five. You know, I mean, it, that does wonders for people when you all of a sudden have a constructive conversation around something. You feel connected. It feels like, boy, this is not all about us. Somehow the shame begins to dissipate a little bit about your circumstances and you do feel more normal. And you find out other people have similar sorts of journeys. And I don't know. It's just There's something about being in isolation that just accentuates shame and self-pity. And all of that gets stolen away when you begin to sit with somebody else and and just open up your life a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think in I reflect back on a, a small group that we did not long ago where I think we had like five or six couples. And the very first night we said, hey, just share your story. And so we gave each couple about 10 minutes to share their story. So, you know, here we are about an hour and a half later talking, <laughs> <laughs> talking about what I would refer to as all of the uh, the mess and the blood that was on the floor because of everybody's real, you know, some of the stories were really heart wrenching. Mm. And so here I am as the, the facilitator and I, I'm thinking, oh God, how do I follow up with that story and that story that's just gut wrenching? And I really felt like the Lord said, ask them if they've been encouraged. 
Hmm. And I said, okay. <laughs> and so I asked that question and they all started saying, yes, I am. I feel more encouraged. And I'm going, why? <laughs> and, and it was like, well, because your story's worse than mine. <laughs> or, oh, you're dealing with the same thing I am. And it was like, oh, okay. So that affinity, they became they became brothers and sisters mm-hmm. within one evening. Yeah. You know, so here's the irony, I think, in what I'm hearing you say, because I think one of the barriers for people is they don't want to go and admit they're a failure. Like if I go and we talk about life, everybody's going to look at us like we're, you know, we got a horn sticking out of our head and we're we're complete failures. The reality is, no, 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 you're not. You're, other people have similar journeys and you can't experience that sort of, I'm going to say it, grace, unless you stick your neck out a little bit and, and just open up. And, you know, again, go and just listen if you would want to do that. You don't even have to share, but it opens that door to that message that, no, you're not a failure. I think that's so important. And men in particular need to hear that because we tend to be a little apprehensive about sitting down with other people and talking about life and relationships. (laughs) But there's so much blessing in it. Mm -hmm. I think another thing that may hold people back from joining a group would be because of all the moving parts you were talking about, Gil, with all schedules and stuff. And some of that to be able to to keep their kids going is motivated by their guilt. So they put their kids before the marriage. And I think sometimes at some point you need to kind of draw a line in the sand and say, no, we're going to take Tuesday nights to do this for us to go to a group or something. And yeah, we might miss Johnny's basketball game once or a practice or something, but to really make that a priority and that the marriage gets lost in, as you say, the step family forest of trying to run kids all over for the sake of keeping them happy, which once again, we're talking out both sides of our mouth. You know, yes, it's about the kids, but yes, we've got to be investing in us. Right, right. Because if we have a stronger us, then we will have a stronger family because this is the strongest bond for the entire thing because all the other bonds are unnatural. Mm -hmm. This, This is the bond. And if we don't take care of it and strengthen it, then we're going to end up in a panic pretty quick. Yeah. What about yeah. mentoring relationships? You know, that's kind of a new thing. The uh, last 10 years has really come on strong. Lots of churches have marriage mentor couples. Uh, if somebody's listening right now and they're going, I don't know, do we need that? You know, what would you say? How would you talk around that with with somebody? The biggest challenge is finding a mentoring couple that's in a step family. Getting with a regular first-time married couple, I mean, that's great. And if that's all you've got, go for it. <laughs> But it's really hard to find people that are remarried that are mentoring. Yeah. And, you know, there's so many different twists and turns that first-time marriages don't understand. And sometimes they can do a disservice to a remarried couple. But if that's all you've got, that's better than yeah, to back, you can still get nuggets. Of yeah, that. to back up what you're saying, Brenda, if you've got a mentor couple and they're mentoring a step-family couple, then talk about marriage issues. So far as, you know, if you've got a a remarried couple who's willing and able and isn't overwhelmed with their own stuff and have got a little wear on them and is willing to (laughs) mentor, then boy, you've you've got Mm -hmm. a jewel. Mm -hmm. You've really got a jewel to be able to share their experience. I think for us, we we were very fortunate and we actually got on the phone with somebody who had been a, a remarried couple for years when we first got started. And that really helped me be grounded, even if we had the phone call with him just saying, no, no, you're not going crazy. This is this is normal. And if it's in that context, some form of encouragement is better than none at all. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think mentoring is a great way to go. Yeah, but again, I agree with you. You've got to find somebody who's actually lived a little life in a blended family a little bit ahead of you. Doesn't mean they're experts. Nobody's asking mentors to no. be mm-hmm. experts or have all the answers, but to just walk beside and just go ahead of you a little bit. I know you guys have resources that are available. I wrote a a mentoring guide that goes along with my book, The Smart Step Family, which is just so it's a very simple tool that would allow a couple to walk through that book with another couple and just have conversation and dialogue. There are tools like that that are available that can help people. By the way, if you're listening and you've you're thinking, boy, maybe we could mentor somebody with a tool like that. Or maybe you're already a marriage mentor. You didn't know that tool was available. Go to the show notes and uh, we'll let you know how you can get that. What about dating couples and engaged couples? Is any of this different? The, the small group thing, should they go to a small group even though they're not married yet? Should they 
perhaps connect to a marriage mentor? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, we love to talk to those that are contemplating remarriage because Brenda's job is what, Brenda? <laughs> <laughs> I don't say this in the first session because I scare them off. <laughs> but, you know, our goal is to break them up. Uh, what do you mean by that? Whoa, somebody just went, well, wait, wait, you <laughs> wait, want to break what? us up. What do you mean by but that? We're in love. <laughs> well, because so many times a remarriage, you know, you're coming into it, you have found love again. So you are, you know, happy and, and hopeful and which is great. But most of the time when you're coming back into together, you're to create a step family, there's children involved. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that the marriage is solid. So we want to be tough and ask the tough questions of the couple to make sure that they can weather what's coming ahead of them because they may not see it because, yes. Uh, would you please be honest? <laughs> you you make it really hard on them because you put it a lot stronger. I want you to realize, people, that if you can get through me, then you're you're de you give them a you give them a cold bucket of reality. Yeah, I mean, you give them a cold it. bucket of water of, mm. of reality because this isn't going to be easy. And if you think it is, it's not a walk in a park. It doesn't start out slow. It starts out at full steam. And it's not just about the couple. It's no. about the kids. Yes. There's far too many moving parts yeah. to, to so, dilly dally into yeah. this. Yeah. So I, I think that's really an important part when we do, like when we do our seminars and workshops, we love it when couples who are contemplating remarriage or starting the remarriage thing is to have them come in and actually hear what's out there. What's, what's this going to be like? And then be able to hear other couples talk about it so that the environment is really one of, okay, this is a real problem. What, are you going to do? And mm -hmm. and sometimes you don't know what you're going to do until you're in the middle of it. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you can prepare until the cows come home, <laughs> but you don't know until you're there. Mm -hmm. And we also invite singles to our seminars because, you know, someday they're contemplating, maybe if I do get remarried, what is this going to look like? Mm -hmm. yeah, we don't scare them as bad. We do. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> Great idea. Just a little. <laughs> and, I, and believe me, I hear your heart, and I, I hope our listeners hear in your heart. What you're wanting to do is just help people open both eyes and see it for what it is yes. and count the cost well so that that decision is something that truly is a blessing for them and their children rather than they inadvertently walked into something and then find themselves in a hole they can't climb out of. Right. And for us, it's really important. You know, we've worked with couples premarital that have broken up. And, and we even say this in the beginning, to us, that's a win because we've stopped another divorce. Yes. So it's okay if that's where we end up. It's okay because through the journey, you've learned more about yourself, but you've saved your kids from a train wreck. Let's talk a little bit about churches. How does a step family couple find a church that will be supportive to their life? Now, I know this is a big setup question. Like we have wrestled with this for years, the three of us have. I just want to lead by saying one of the things at Family Life that we're trying to do is make it possible for churches and couples to find each other so we have a searchable map. If you, the listener, would just go to familylife.com slash blended, click on events, you will find a map that you can search and find where maybe a church is hosting our annual live stream event, Blended and Blessed. You can find a map where a small group is being offered in a church, or if Gil and Brenda are doing a conference at a church somewhere, that can be be on the map. You can find something near you and go and get connected to where a step family ministry already exists. The reason that's important is because so very, very, very few churches have anything specifically for blended families. We're trying to change that here at Family Life Blended. Right. Mm -hmm. But you can find what's available now. Now, the map of the U.S. is not just loaded down with locations, right? And it ebbs and flows mm -hmm. through different seasons when churches start groups or, you know, and then take a break or whatever. So I share that with our listener because I want you to know, go to the map, check it out, see what you can find. If your church has a ministry, please add it to the map. It's free, all right? It's free for you to do that. Now, having said that, somebody goes to the map and lo and behold, there's nothing within 200 miles of where they live. How do they think about church and where they go. What are they looking for in a church that would be supportive? What kinds of things could churches do that would go, man, maybe we ought to go here or 
you know, even if they're if they're really plugged into a church, and their church offers nothing, how would they start something? What are your thoughts around that? Wow, that's a loaded question. Because yeah, we've been talking about this for what about eight or nine, ten years, and the groundswell continues to build, which is great. So yeah, let's say for instance you are in a church or a community and nothing's around you for a couple hundred miles. And you have a burden to begin something because not only do you want the support, but you you really have a call upon your heart to encourage others. I would say a couple things. Be willing to be the first boots on the ground in your area. You might be, you know, literally building a beachhead for something that might not take full fruition for a couple of years. So get the blessing and allow pastoral staff and so forth to know what you're doing to gain their awareness of what you're doing. They may ask a few questions, and in that place, refer back to the materials and so forth that you would potentially use, either something from uh, from Family Life or from what Brenda and I have put together. Mm -hmm. You know, it's theologically sound. You know, the pastoral staff doesn't want you to be presenting something that, for some reason, they think is promoting divorce. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't know why they get that idea, but for some reason, there's there's a hiccup there, and it's like, no, we we're not doing that. We're trying to support the people that are in the remarriage arena. They need support. And so be humble, but also be bold. Because if it means that you don't get the blessing and you know so forth, then say, okay, we'll start off in our home, even if it's with two or three couples. But be willing to start with whatever you're allowed to start with. If you get a space at the church on Wednesday night, then count yourself blessed. Because <laughs> right. that's a really big deal. And, and in different parts around the country, that happens and sometimes it doesn't. I think the other thing that comes to my mind if you're contemplating on starting a a blended family ministry is for whatever reason you can possibly make it possible, get to the annual blended family uh, summit, the summit on step family ministry that Family Life has has graced us with all around the country for, I think this is year number seven or eight. Mm -hmm. It's a great place to come and connect with others to get the training and information. So Educate yourself and then just allow yourself to step into it, kind of get into the shallow water first. But I, that's my encouragement to those that are contemplating it is start someplace. Brenda, have you seen that work where a couple boots on the ground, they start something and it actually grows into something that's really a blessing? And 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 if a couple is listening right now, and they're going, we're so unprepared. We're unequipped for this. Like, could we lead that group? What would you say? Yes. Well, (laughs) I say yes, but I guess I would make sure that at some level their house is in order. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be perfect by any means. But, I mean, if they're in the throes of court dates and really messy, messy stuff, they need to make sure that they're at least on some kind of level level footing themselves. Yeah, just in terms of health and their relationships. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have to be perfect, but they can't be bleeding out everywhere because they're going to be bleeding out over everybody else. And another thing I think that's the the hardest thing is, you know, we know, we all know that there's so many blended families and we do seminars and we think the room should be packed and they never are for whatever reason. So I guess my charge to those boots on the ground is don't look at the numbers. If we know that we can impact one family positively, that's one legacy that we've help strengthen. And that's, that's it. You can't look at, oh, there's, we have 20 couples coming because that's probably not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. It tends to start small. I tell people all the mm-hmm. time, you cook your step family with a crock pot. You, you cook your step family ministry with a crock pot. Take who comes and just grow it. People on the outside need to watch and wait and learn if they can trust you, trust what's happening there. Sometimes people have been bitten by the church in the past mm-hmm. and they're not exactly sure what they can trust. So don't worry about the numbers. I, I totally agree. Right. Yeah. Right. Also, why keep it in the church? We've done small groups at the YMCA or sometimes libraries offer room free. And that you're throwing the net wider where you can get people that have been burned by the church and don't want to go to church, but will go to a community center for discussion. So that's an option. I think maybe a practical tip if you're feeling unprepared to lead a group is get a a co-leader, a person or another couple. Sometimes that's a maybe a more mature marriage mentor couple, and they work in marriage ministry. They're not a blended family, but they do know a lot about relationships, and we'll co-lead that together. 
sit right. on opposite sides yeah. of the circle and let each of you play to one another's strengths. But together, then it, all the burden is not on you. Find somebody to share that with. And I think that's a great way to start. And really, that's that's the message I think we would want to give people is just get started. You know, don't sit back and wish and wish and wish that your church would do something. Honestly, you know, you know, we have a lot of materials between what you guys have created and what we've got at Family Life to help you approach your church and your pastor and try to garner support and help show the case for why this is an important thing. Access some of that. But at the end of the day, they're probably going to say, hey, you're the one who's motivated. We're going to turn you loose, you know, support you, but but it's on you. Now, let me ask you this, because I've run into people who go, yeah, we tried that. We're really motivated. We came to the Summit on Step Family Ministry. We got our Step Family Ministry one-on-one training. We, we bought resources. We prepared ourselves, and our church won't give us permission. They just will not bless it. Now what? Well, you take a step back and look at one another and basically kind of go, okay, if if we're not going to get that, you know, that room on Thursday night at the church, then open your home mm. and start with one other couple who is saying, we really need to have a place. Mm. Then that probably is where you start. You know, we're, we're not doing anything illegal or immoral or, or, <laughs> or, no. or, 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 or Ill, 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 you know, false <laughs> theological perspective. My, my encouragement to a couple who might get that message, unfortunately, from leadership is please don't be discouraged. This happens far more than than we all would want to happen. But please don't be discouraged. Go ahead and start small. If it's one or two other couples, then that's where you're at. You need that encouragement as well. And if it's in your own home, there's no harm, no foul. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think you can just get started. Often that's the case, I think, the pastoral team just doesn't quite fully understand the need or what you're doing, and they just don't get it. I have run into some situations where I think the pastoral team was truly against it. They were, they understood what was being asked, and they were not in favor of it. And so that's discouraging. And I would say in in extreme circumstances like that, you might need to find another church. I, I mean, what is that telling you about the theology of the leadership and how they feel about people who don't quite measure up to the standards, whatever that means? Maybe that maybe that is a big reason to consider going somewhere else. But that would be kind of an extreme posture, I think. Thank you for saying that. You kind of wanted that to, because didn't you? The, uh, well, I, I it's your show, so I thought I'd let you say it. But but I think I just want to back up to the listener. The ground is level at the foot of the cross, and if you are getting a message that you are less than, that's not the right message of the gospel. Yeah, yeah. God God has redeemed you; He has not condemned you. Mm-hmm. Because you've gone through a divorce or a remarriage does not make you a second-class Christian. There isn't a, as you said, Ron, there isn't such a thing as a first-class Christian. Right. We are all at the foot of the cross. And if you're feeling condemned, then then please hear this message. God's grace sees through that as well. And, and you are not condemned. Uh, let's move on to one more thing. It's, it occurs to me in this day and age, with all the digital uh, options that we have available to us, there are ways to stay connected and find support, not in a local church, not in a small group. You can do this on social media. Uh, you know, you're listening to a podcast right now. There's a way to stay connected to something that's feeding your heart, your mind, and your soul. Blended and Blessed events, our live stream event, where you just bring a few people together and spend a day going through an event. You know, there's weekend retreats sometimes, there's community socials and opportunities to just have a few people over once a month. It doesn't have to be a formal thing. There's lots of ways. I'm curious, have you guys ever accessed any of those just in your own personal journey or seen it seen it work well for somebody else? I think like the, the Blended and Blessed event is incredible because they can do it in their home. It doesn't have to be at a church. And it's, it can be a very casual, inviting, hey, come on over if you can even come for part of it. And it kind of gets that momentum going. 
that sometimes we need to like, oh, this could work. We could meet even once a month. It doesn't have to be hardcore every week, just something. So right. Touch. Right. I think that we've interacted with couples who do the once a week, once a month. And, you know, in our region of the country, which is up in the northwest part of the country, we put the invitation out to people that, hey, once a year, we're going to have what we call the Restored and Remarried Barbecue. And in and, and jest, we have people come literally from sometimes a couple <laughs> hundred miles away just to hang out for the day. Wow. Wow. It's crazy. So, it, you know, people are hungry for it. If if the platform is there, they'll come. It's kind of, what was that old line? If you build it, they will come. Uh-huh. So, you know. <laughs> and if the barbecue is good, they will come. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, don't count the numbers. Yeah. Don't look at the numbers. Okay, let's shift our conversation a little bit to somebody who's listening right now, and they're just not needing support. They're, they're in pain a little bit. Something's not going well. They're hurting over how their family or marriage is going. People ask, how do I know if I need to go to a counselor? Is this a support group problem? <laughs> is this a uh, go to a therapist sort of problem? Should I just go to a pastor? You know, there's a lot of different options to people in terms of who they seek out. Do you have some thoughts on guiding people through that decision process? I just think how even you laid it out there, Ron, is is maybe start with the mentor, kind of going, you know, if they've got some experience, hey, is this normal? Uh, whoa, you've yeah, you've got some normal, but you've got you've got some dysfunction there. Then maybe take it to the next step and say, hey, pastor, and the pastor may go, whoa, this is kind of above my head, but here's some resources, but here's a few things you can do. But truly, if there is a breakdown in communication, it's dysfunctional, there are attachment wounds and really some destructive behaviors or complete confusion, then at that point in time, you need to seek out a counselor. And in that case, being able to find a counselor who specializes in step families, that that's a pretty rare bird in most communities. Yeah. Let's let's come back to that one because I think that's worth unpacking. But what I hear you saying is, and it's kind of like an analogy I've used before, sometimes you get a cold, but you don't know if it's the flu or the cold, right? And so <laughs> you're not really sure what to do with that. You just feel kind of cruddy and uh, you blow your nose a lot and you're, you know. So if it's a cold, it's going to go away in five to seven days. If it doesn't go away... That's kind of the first indication, maybe I got the flu, maybe, or I got a fever. Okay, so there's another thing here that's indicating this is more than just something small. I probably should go see a doctor now. I've often said to people, it's not rocket science. Nobody can tell you exactly how to know. But if this thing lingers, if it's not passing, if you find yourself stuck over and over and over, or something is sort of escalating around this, it's time to stop talking to Brother Joe at church, and it's time to go to somebody who can really give you some guidance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, if, to your analogy of the, the cold to the flu, I think in, as a counselor, it's the ability to determine with people, is this truly an attachment wound that's something that is a, in a relational problem that stems not just in the remarriage, but it might stem further back? Potentially, is there trauma? Is there something there that that is really a very deep matter that is your issue that seems to somehow keep showing up and throwing the family and the marriage system into convulsions and you just can't get any traction? It could be a pretty serious problem. And in that case, yeah, being able to go in and sit down with a counselor to kind of comb through that and, and have a safe environment and then bring, you know, the other spouse in potentially to do some couples work. You know, being able to understand that the emotions are something that have to be trained just like your muscles sometimes. And so the ability to train your emotions to not run away with you and slow down or find out what is it that's causing that emotion to run away with me is understanding potentially cycles of emotion that not only set me off, but everybody around me because they got their cycle too. So Mm -hmm. it gets pretty technical, but when you're sitting with somebody who can walk that through with you, they can break it down and help you get control of your emotions and then help the relationship. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so I want us to just walk through the options people have if they're going to go see a professional because I find people are often confused about this. There's a psychiatrist, there's a psychologist, 
There's a psychotherapist. There's a licensed therapist. You'll hear that sometimes. There's pastoral counselors or ministers. There's marriage mentors, which we've talked a little bit about. Those are like just couples that just have some life experience and wisdom, and they're kind of trying to just, you know, encourage and come alongside. And then there's even this distance coaching and therapy option that's available in this technological age. Let's just talk around for a minute. Psychiatrists versus psychologists versus therapists. What, you know, what are, you, what are your thoughts around that? So a psychiatrist is a medical doctor, right? Correct, correct. The psychiatrist has the ability to, in his case, because he's a medical doctor, he can actually prescribe medications. If he feels as though there's something emotionally that really is in need of medication, he can do that. He's, he's the one with the credential. The psychologist, on the other hand, isn't going to maybe issue meds because he's not qualified, but he can definitely get into the technical diagnostics of, of what is the pathology, what is the problem, what's, what's mixed up in your head or maybe in your heart. And so he's a professional that is really going to dial it down into here is the real issue and then maybe be able to work with you from there. As a counselor, because as a licensed counselor here in the state of Washington, I, I have the right to, because of my credentials, be able to maybe give a diagnosis that, you know, that, that the insurance company wants or something. But my job as a counselor is to help you find the journey through that. I'm not going to issue you meds. I'm going to issue, let's get to the heart of the issue. And sometimes that needs a helper. I mean, I have some uh, colleagues that refer to themselves as therapists. I refer to myself as a counselor. I, I have the credential, but I want to be seen as your advocate. I want to be seen as your helper to get through the dark night of the soul. A mentor, a mentor or a biblical counselor, they may be very biblically sound, but they may not have the psychological training that you know the other three have. Mm -hmm. So it really is what fits you and what are you comfortable with. I think the other thing too is, is that what fits you, but also what's effective. Oh, uh, yeah. Because... Not everybody needs to take Prozac because Prozac masks the problem. You don't get down to the root. And some psychologists won't do that. Yeah, so that's really good. What's effective? I think sometimes we go to a family doctor and he tries to deal with something and then they'll say, you know what, I think maybe you need to go to see the specialist for this particular aspect of that. So within the mental health field, there are people that have specializations in certain things. There are people that are more generalists. And so sometimes you do have to move from one to the next to kind of find the right fit, the right person to help with that. But to just sum up, I think it's important. Psychiatrists are medical doctors, MDs. They treat basically the body the way a medical doctor would treat other things, but they're going to treat mental disorders as that's labeled with medication more often than not. They don't do a lot of talk therapy. They do a lot of medication therapy. Psychologists, psychotherapists as another label, licensed therapists could be doctors level, could be masters level, but they have a license in their state to practice the the art of counseling, if you will. They've been trained specifically in, in sitting down and working through situations with people and relationships, and they have expertise in that area. Now, before we come back to this issue of finding a good step family therapist, a word about marriage intensives, because that's something that has come on the scene the last 10 years. You're seeing more and more Christian organizations and even individual practice doing marriage intensives. I've done those for, I guess, 12 years or so. Uh, you also do marriage intensives where a couple will come and spend three days or four days sitting with you working through. So instead of one hour at a time, which personally I've just done away with that model, that's based on money and the economics of the business, has nothing to do with helping people, in my opinion. But um, now we have an extended period of time with an intensive, and you're going to spend, you know, three or four days, you're going to spend 24 to 30 hours working on something. You can really dig in deep. Is that You guys have had good experience doing intensives, right? Yeah, it was, what we love about it is, like you said, you don't have to stop at an hour and say, okay, we're done. You know, we, we might have to go an hour and a half, two hours to get to the nitty gritty of something to have a breakthrough. And that's that has just been powerful. I think when we do a three-day intensive, that's worth six months of counseling if you were to go one hour a week. So 
it's really, it just gives some couples some traction and, and more than anything, it gives them hope because they have some time where they can talk together without being interrupted and have some guidance. Along with that, Brenda, I think they are able to stay in context uh, because mm-hmm. they don't have the interruption of, oh, we'll see you next week. They can actually stay within the context and they don't have to take that interruption to come back to, to get, you know, where did we leave off? Yeah. But I, again, I think that, as you said, Ron, it's it's that ability to press through the issue. Um, I think a quick story is a particular couple we were working with. We were at hour two and a half. And it was like, hey, I think we need to take a break, not only because this is getting intense, but, you know, I need to go to the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and, 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 and in all reality, the lady, I just loved her. She, she looked across the table at me and went, and she gently, not pounded, but she gently hit the table and said, no, this is why we're here. <laughs> and, and, and I went, okay, you're on. <laughs> and I loved her heart. I mm. loved her heart because she, literally about a half an hour later, there was the breakthrough, mm-hmm. we, and that that was the beauty. Then we took the break. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and when you say breakthrough, Gil, I think what we're really big on is people connecting. You know, a lot of times people come to us and say we have a communication problem, and it's not communication, it's connection. And the breakthrough is really an amazing thing because the Holy Spirit breaks through in a hard place in that person's heart, and it is stalling out the marriage. Now, it could be kid-related, it could be step-family related, it could be all kinds of issues related, but that's the breakthrough, is when the heart softens Mm -hmm. and they begin to turn toward one another and then connect with one another and then begin that dance of resonation, that's beautiful because now you know God is working in their heart and that's where the change takes place. Yeah, I agree. I think intensives are a great model, not necessarily for everybody. It requires a lot of time and it's expensive. Because as you said, you're getting six months worth in, you know, and three or four days rather than doing six months, one hour a week uh, in a process. So it's not for everybody. But what I often tell people is if you've tried the outpatient counseling thing and it really hasn't worked for you, it just might be time to consider the intensive. And one of the things I want our listeners to know is that I'm trying to build a network of uh, recognized smart step family therapy providers, people that have done their homework gone through some additional training, which I am beginning to ramp up to do. If you're a therapist and you want to know more about this, you're going to go to my personal website, smartstepfamilies.com, and learn how to do that. Gil and Brenda's name is already among the list of people that I recommend that are available around the country. You can find that information, again, on smartstepfamilies.com. Also on my website, we'll put this in the show notes as well, an article on how to find a competent Christian step family therapist. Sometimes you don't have the option of doing an intensive, going where Gil and Brenda live or wherever. You don't have anybody in your neighborhood that you know of that is qualified. And so how do you go about it? Just a quick thought for our listener, and then we'll move on. But it's as simple as, and the article kind of walks you through. You could say your pastor recommends a therapist, and you call them and you just ask this question. <laughs> what do you do differently when working with blended families than you do when working with maybe a first marriage situation? If they don't have an answer to that question, then they're probably not going to be a good fit for you. You need to move on to the next one. If they can give you, wow, well, typically this is different and that's different. And sometimes we have to deal with this. And here's why we would have to deal with it. Yep, that's somebody who's done their homework and you might feel a little more confident about going and hanging out with them. Yeah. Sometimes people wonder if their kids should go to counseling. I'm an advocate that you get as many people in the room as you can when the timing is right. That's up to the counselor to help you decide. But kids, the older they are, the more of an opinion they have about what's going on in their family and their life, and the more they need somebody to hear them too. Intensives tend to be centered around just the couple, because it's hard to bring six people on an airplane to, you know, to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and that, that adds to the expense of the whole ex- experience. But you can get a lot done just working with one couple because, as you guys say, if they don't have the marriage, they've got nothing. But for people who have outpatient therapy, it's a good idea for them to get their kids involved. Is that what you think? Yeah, and I, I liked what you said, Ron, in that the timing is important because the preparation 
is very important. One of the, the, the modalities that I kind of work from is a thing called internal family systems, which has a lot to do with trauma because going through a divorce potentially and a remarriage is on the ACEs scale, which is the adverse childhood experiences research. Divorce is one among 10 particular things considered traumatic. And so the systems within the family are actually working from and trying to recover from trauma which is how do we do this and what did it do to me emotionally that could potentially throw me off? So yeah, that kiddo comes in and they may need some free space to themselves to have the freedom to speak up and say how they're really feeling before you bring mom and dad in or vice versa. So that's, that's a really important thing. I think the other thing too is the, the issue of coaching over the video, just to put a word in for that, sometimes somebody thinks they're in crisis, but in reality, Actually, they just needed somebody that knew what they were talking about that they can't get to, and the video conferencing or the video coaching is adequate. We've had that happen a couple times. So just to kind of put a word in for that. But back to that place of when you're able to bring the whole family in, get to hearing, and then bring it all together. That's fantastic because then you can begin to have some common ground to work on. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So what if you want to go to counseling, but your spouse or your child or somebody that's connected to the situation won't go? Are you stuck? Is it hopeless? Should you go anyway? I'd go anyway because (laughs) so many times in a family situation, it's easy to blame everybody else because your needs aren't being met. So that might be a, a great growing opportunity for you to explore what's going on in your own heart because you can't control what's going on in anybody else's, right? Mm -hmm. And that could be a great opportunity for you to understand more where you're at, where your pain is, how to better support your family, have empathy. I think it's better to do that, to go yourself, than not do anything at all. I have a couple of clients right now that are in step family situations and only one of the couple, usually in this case, it's the ladies, who are willing to come in and because of what they're learning and and gaining information, they actually then start acting differently. They start talking differently. They start regulating their emotions differently. And then all of a sudden I have the husband sitting in my office <laughs> because it's like, what did you do to my wife? And I was like, well, she had a safe place to talk. Would you like to you know, learn how to do that? And it's an, an amazing thing that if, if you can't get buy-in, there might be some fear. There might be some, I don't know about this, or, you know, I'm not going to go to a shrink, you know, I got to lay down on the couch and be all. So, you know, don't let your other half, so to say, create the obstacle. Go ahead, get what you can, and and eventually maybe they'll come along with. Yeah, if there's anything Romans 12 teaches us is that we have a lot of power in relationships just by managing ourselves. You can overcome evil with good. Uh, You can't stop somebody from being evil, but you can make it really hard for them to continue acting that way by changing who you are and managing yourself, regulating yourself within the context of the relationship. So, yes, go and get support and learn what you can do to be a better you. That will make a difference. Will it fix everything? Will it make the other people perfect the way you think they should be perfect? Probably not. But it will <laughs> but it will ripple some change. So there's definitely hope in that situation. Well while people are looking for support or going to counseling, I've got a list of attitudes here that I think will help sustain them when they're in the process of working through some changes. Let's just talk around them a little bit. I think In love, have empathy for other people, and in humility, change yourself. We just talked a little bit about that Mm -hmm. change in yourself piece and how powerful it ultimately is, and that's always a place where we start. What's about this having empathy for others, especially in in a blended family situation? Why is it important to have empathy for others? Well, my definition of empathy is is really the act of feeling with someone else, but deeper than that, I'm actually suffering with them. I'm, I'm feeling what they're feeling. And, and, and actually, what's unique about this is when I'm in a conversation with a couple, I refer to an old love song called When I Fall in Love. It's a sappy, romantic <laughs> song, but there's a line in there that is true empathy, that when I feel that you feel the way I feel, that's when I fall in love with you. 
But in reality, when I feel what you feel, that I feel the same way I do, that's when I forgive you. That's when I understand you. That's when I connect with you and not a moment sooner. That's empathy. Mm. Mm -hmm. And the reason that's really helpful, one reason it's helpful, I think, in blended families is because people have had such... Uh, diverse experiences merging into this family. You have children that lost a parent to death. You have another child whose parents divorced. You have one adult who's been through that divorce and knows a whole lot more than the child knows about what happened behind the scenes. And you have one adult who was widowed and had a great marriage, and they don't know what a bad marriage would be like. They've never experienced that. Now they're married to somebody who definitely knows what a bad marriage looks like. Like, uh, those are four different emotional states standing in the same living room, to be able to look across and go, huh, what's it like to be that person dealing with me? I wonder what they experience when we have these conversations or conflicts. That begins to help move your heart a little bit closer to theirs. Right, because the the entryway into the remarried step family world is always through the doorway of pain. Mm. Always. You don't get there because it was, you were invited or, oh, I'm going to go do that. (laughs) Oh, that looks like fun. No, it's through a doorway of pain. Yeah. And I always, especially the ladies, but this could go to the guys too. I always ask, would you come home to you? Oh, wow. What a good question. I usually say don't answer, but just think about that for a minute (laughs) because that's, that would be evoking empathy. It's like, wow, what am I projecting? Mm. Because from that place, you can now tap into your levels of humility, which means I've taken a really good stock of my strengths and my weaknesses. I don't take myself too seriously, but I can humble myself for the sake of the other. And when I begin to understand my humility, there's a weight to who you are as a person that's approachable, as trusted, and now, now we're, we're really cooking with some good stuff there at that point, because if I can enter into a relationship with someone who understands empathy and has a humble spirit, then we're, we're well on our way to some strength. Let's just do one more. Counseling is a process. Going to a small group is a process. I think people need to be really committed to the process, right? Yeah, I think sometimes if they have a little bit of being uncomfortable in those situations, they say, oh, it's not for me. And so many times I think it's important for them to give it a chance. You know, if that first time it's like, oh, I'm not ever going back. Well, maybe that's the point that you do need to go back and kind of push through a little bit. I like the concept of process, but I would like to encourage another concept to the listener. Processing is indeed a process. It takes time. But the ultimate is, is not to get lost in the cycle of the process, but eventually after you've kind of flushed things out and whirled it around and okay, good, you eventually do a little thing that I refer to as digest, which means flush. We, we have to flush some of those things out, but sometimes you don't know how to do it and you need someone to help you. That's the ultimate. We've processed together. Now we are like, you know, like the band of brothers. We've lived through a war zone and now I've got a friend but they have helped me digest. They've helped me not just process it, but actually get it out and have some closure. And get unstuck. Yes, get unstuck. Yeah, eventually you're going to get to some change. That's the whole point. You've been listening to my conversation with Gil and Brenda Stewart. I'm Ron Deal, and this is Family Life Blended. We'll hear one last thought from Gil and Brenda in just a minute, but while we get ready to do that, Would you review the podcast? Maybe a rating, too. It really does help others find us, and we'd appreciate that. Speaking of reviews, Gil and Brenda Stewart endorsed my new book with Dr. Gary Chapman. They say, Step families need a common language to build trust, connection, and new attachments. Building Love Together in Blended Families, the name of the book, provides a path to speak love mutually so each family member can accept the love they need to grow closer. This is a wonderful hands-on resource. Well, I appreciate them saying that. You can get your copy at shop.familylife.com. I want to revisit something Gil and Brenda and I talked about We were talking about how helpful it is for blended family couples to get together with other couples in their local church or a small group or a study group of some kind. But 
let me tell you the reality. Many couples just won't go (laughs) or they go inconsistently. I want to speak to this for just a minute. Let me ask you, why don't you go? Listen, in our world today, we think pretty highly of ourselves being tech savvy and we can stay connected with tons of people all the time, right? Well, actually, no, wrong. We say we're connected, but really we're just surface connected. What we really seem to value is light connections, to be honest. That allows us to stay emotionally closed off and distant and disconnected and hidden. We can control the level of vulnerability that we have with others. We control our exposure. We control the narrative about what people know about us, right? That's what fake book is really all about. We socially distance on a regular basis under the guise of being real. But that self-deception doesn't really pay off. It's just pseudo-connection and leaves us lonely and wondering why we can't break out of our ruts. You can't grow without connection with others. I really believe that. Without vulnerability, when you refuse to go or start a small group, if that's what it takes uh, for you to be involved in, you leave money on the table. I mean, there's opportunity here that we just don't take advantage of. Listen, this podcast, (laughs) I believe in it. It's designed to encourage and inspire you. But if you really want to grow, you need to get beyond just data in, just taking in information. You need to interact with others who are on a similar journey so you can help each other, so so you can encourage each other, so you can grow. By the way, we at Family Life Blended and at Family Life have lots of resources that you can study with others. We even have a searchable map so you can find an existing group in your area, or if you have a group, you can post it so other people can find you. Just go to familylife.com slash blended and click view events in order to find that map. Let me encourage you, become a part of a group. It will help change your life. If you'd like more information about our guests, you can find it in our show notes, or you can just check it out on the Family Life Blended podcast page. That's at familylife.com slash podcasts. And while you're there, check out everything Family Life has to offer for your marriage and family. We're an international organization providing practical marriage and family help for your life and those you care about. Our division, Family Life Blended, has the largest collection of articles, videos, resources, and books for blended families in the world. Check us out at familylife.com. One of our annual events is called the Summit on Step Family Ministry. That's an equipping event for lay couples like you, for ministry leaders, for people who care about others, counselors, and so on. This year, it's going to be October 1 and 2, 2020. Just go to summitonstepfamilies.com to get all the information that you need about that. Well, we've got one last word from Gil and Brenda. I asked them about helping others when you feel unprepared to do so. What if a friend comes to somebody who's listening right now or someone asks you to lead that small group like we were talking about earlier um, and and something rises up and says, man, I am not equipped. I'm not ready for that. I don't, who am I to be able to sit and have coffee with somebody and try to listen to their situation? I think people underestimate the power of the living God in them for those moments. I think people, I think we all underestimate the power of presence, that showing up is half the battle. And no, you don't always know what to do or say. And by the way, here's a big secret about us therapists. We don't either. (laughs) Agreed. You know, but it's true. It's true, right? We don't have all the answers for life. Sometimes we just need to trust that being a friend is a valuable thing to do. I couldn't agree more. I mean, every day that I drive into my office, I I really pray that this particular prayer, Lord, I got nothing to offer other than you. Yeah, I've got this education and this experience and these gray hairs, but unless the Holy Spirit shows up with his presence, then it really isn't going to be effective. And that's the difference. So if you feel like I'm not qualified, well, Okay, there were a few other people that didn't feel qualified, like Moses, for instance. Yeah, right. (laughs) You know, hey, who am I to do this? The the qualification is willingness. And if you're willingly going to step into that, 
then the Holy Spirit will show up, the materials mm -hmm. will show up, mm -hmm. and and you begin to understand presence. That really is just right on right on point. Uh, it's the willingness to step into it and trust God with the rest. And what a gift to a friend, because I think especially in culture today, we're so all self-absorbed and we don't take the time to step back to offer that cold cup of water to somebody. No, we don't have the answers, but I can sit here in this with you. And that's part of empathy. Mm. Yeah, I think one thing is, is that sometimes we feel like we have to carry the load and that's not what is being asked of you. You're being asked to hold someone else's pain for a moment, not to carry it for them, just hold mm -hmm. the load for a moment. Give them a moment to take a breath. And if that's just for 15 or 20 minutes or 45 minutes in that small group setting, then you've done your job and then they can go on their way. Next time, we're gonna hear from Lori Ferguson Wilbert about being first in your husband's heart when you're his second wife. You know, in the church in particular, I think there are some unfortunate narratives around divorce and remarriage. And I think I feel acutely aware of being a second wife, depending on who I'm around and what their thoughts about it are or what they suspect to be my husband's story, but don't know to be true. That's Lori Ferguson Wilbert next time on Family Life Blended. I'm Ron Deal. Thanks for listening. And thanks to our Family Life legacy partners for making this podcast possible. To help us produce this podcast and other resources, you can make a tax-deductible donation specifically for Family Life Blended by going to familylife.com slash blended. Or if you'd rather, call 1-800-FL-TODAY and tell them your gift is for Family Life Blended. If you become a monthly partner, we'll send you a gift card to our Weekend to Remember Marriage Conference held throughout the United States and Canada. Our chief audio engineer is Keith Lynch, Bruce Goff, our producer. Our mastering engineer is Justin Adams and theme music provided by Braden Deal. Family Life Blended is produced by Family Life and is part of the Family Life Podcast Network.